Okay. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, great turnout. Appreciate everybody coming here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kayes. I'm with the University of Maryland Extension. Uh, I actually work out of the Western Maryland Research and Education Center out by Hagerstown. Uh, but uh, Lyle Almond is our uh, Forest Stewardship Educator. He works out of the Y. And Ginny Rosencrantz, who you met in the back, who took care of all the registration and everything is, uh, is down in Worcester County. Um, uh, so she's been a great help in making this event happen and everything. So this is a forest health workshop. So how many folks here are from the shore? Okay. How many people here own more than one acre of land? Okay. All right. So more than 10 acres. Okay. All right. So it's a good, good representation. So the purpose of this workshop really generated out of uh, some work we've been doing at Emerald Dash Bore. Who here has heard of Emerald Dash Bore? Okay. Good. So. Uh, but we didn't think that anybody would come to a forest health workshop that just dealt with emerald ash borer. So we kind of made it a little more inclusive to include a number of things that mention that deal with forest health. And uh, that's kind of the purpose of the day. And you should have a packet of information in here. Um, and there's an agenda. And uh, we plan on being done uh, about 12. And we'll have lunch, which you can eat. And then um, you know, we, can, we can adjourn. So, um, so the purpose here is to get some information on some, a range of events. And uh, if you look at I've, my um, uh, purpose here, really, initially, is just to kind of give a little basics on, on woodland health to kind of put things in perspective. So um, uh, in terms of you know, what is a healthy forest or what is a healthy woodland, uh, I always often talk to folks and say, well, you know, woods are kind of like trees. It's kind of like a healthy person. You know, what are the things that make a person healthy? When you think of somebody who's healthy, what, what kind of terms come to mind? Huh? Thin, okay, in shape, you know, vigorous, you know, they get exercise, you know, they, they have some purpose, you know, they, 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 they have a place there. And when we look at woodlands, uh, you know, when we look at people, we kind of have a better perspective of what looks healthy. But we looked at woodlands, many times we lack the information that's really necessary to know if we're looking at a healthy woodland or not. Uh, the same way is that we're all doctors now because we have the internet, right? So we know, we know if we're healthy or not, right? We scare ourselves to death going on the internet to see what, what looks healthy and what isn't. But the same thing, I think, goes when we look at woodlands and, and look at the woods that you may own or manage. And if I looked at that picture there, so would somebody look at that, would you tell that it looks healthy pretty there, pretty much? What things would concern you, perhaps? Too many trees, okay. No understory, okay. Well, this is a, this is a pretty sharp crowd, so there's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, again, the reason that many people look at that and see a park-like uh, atmosphere and say, that looks really nice, that's a really nice woods, it must be, it's really healthy. But, in fact, in this case, this is an area with a lot of deer. So the reason there's no understory, there's no regeneration is because of deer. That exact same woodland, about, you know, 50 feet to the way there, that's fenced, starts to look like that. So we know there's certain things that can be done to make woods healthier, you know, in terms of have more vigor to have more resistance and resilience. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So also, what's healthy depends upon what your out, outlook is. So if I ask a forester what's healthy, you know, it's meeting the management goals and insect disease or lower levels. You know, a wildlifer might say there's a mosaic of trees opening, providing a variety of habitat for a diverse wildlife. Hydrologist is looking at the ground, seeing how spongy it is, make sure it's absorbing water, and, and so on. Fire ecologist, and if you're a wilderness person, you know, are there natural processes delayed to play out without human interference? So these are all different opinions in terms of you know, what's healthy. But I guess I would, as we go through the day today, you're going to hear about a number of different, um, we, we tried to focus on the major, uh, some of the major uh, forest pest and you know, health issues that are out there. And uh, think about it in this context of the three R's of, of, of resistance, uh, resilience, and uh, recovery. But resistance is basically, think about it this way. You know, what's out there, what can be done to our woods out there that's going to make it possible to help trees defend against some type of disturbance that's going to come along, okay? If it's going to be storms, if it's going to be insects or disease, are there things that can be done to increase the resistance of that woodland to keep it healthier, all right? And that could be anything from, uh, you know, thinning, uh, it could be some planting, uh, it could be removing damaged and infected trees, it could be dealing with a, uh, an early pest problem, you know? Um, just basically resistance. And the other side of that is resilience. And kind of resilience is the other side of that. It's like actions that accommodate some degree of change but encourage a return to prior conditions. 
after a disturbance. And what that really means is that once a disturbance occurs, what type of actions could we take to help bring it back to some semblance of health, you know, to some semblance of stability? And we may use some of the same tools. It may be, you know, thinning. It may be salvaging in the case of an insect or disease problem or something like that. Um, it may be doing some thinning to uh, get more species diversity so we're not relying so much on one species that's more susceptible to attack uh, by different things that may be in the area. So, you know, resistance, kind of tr helping trees defend before something comes along. You know, resilience, what can we do after something has occurred to kind of bring it back. And then, you know, kind of response, you know, with this is kind of a long-term perspective in terms of, you know, what can we do to monitor, understand how those decisions will affect the long-term conditions of what's going to happen there. All right. So does that kind of make sense? It kind of gives you a context of, and what, what's overriding all of this is that there's basically some tools out there that we can use uh, to help make these things happen. And um, in your packet, there's a thing, I think, uh, some key ideas for woodland owners related to climate change and things like that. But, but basically, these are all very similar tools, and they come under the context of silvicultural practices in many cases. Does anybody here know what silviculture means? I'm not going to ask him because he's a forester. <laughs> but it's kind of the science and art of, of growing trees and forests. You know, there's certain things that we know that we can do to manipulate woods and forests to make them have certain outcomes. And we look at this list of key actions with regards to forest health, that's kind of exactly what we're talking about here. You know, what are the things that we can do? Well, maintaining a healthy density. And you may hear about thinning all the time because that's a key tool in forestry because just like people, it maintains you know, growing space. It allows trees to grow more vigorously. And like I said, trees are kind of like people. So the more vigorous they are, the, the better they're growing, the more likely and capable they are to ward off insect and diseases and, and, and things like that. And diversify species. You know, and if, even if you're planting or if you have an existing forest stand or the things that can be done to alter the age classes or perhaps the species. We know that works with the gypsy moth. You know, stands that have less than 70 or 80 percent in, in, in stocking in, in oaks are probably going to be less susceptible to gypsy moss. So there are things that could be done in terms of um, creating that resistance, you know, in a stand prior to having something that comes in, some type of problem. You know, drought resistant species. That's less of a problem down here. It's more the other way, right? Because <laughs> the sea level is getting higher. Um, diversifying age structures, building connectivity. Controlling invasive species and vines. And, and one of the biggest drains and stressors on forests in many cases is, is vines. And uh, people don't realize that. By taking, cutting vines off at the bottom of the trees, you remove a lot of stress off trees. And they're much less susceptible to overload by ice and snow and things like that. And of course, as a person who deals with deer all the time, managing deer. Yes? TSI? T yeah, timber stand improvement, right, which is kind of like thinning in a sense, right? You're, you're, you're improving the stand by, by removing certain trees. So just to give you an example, of, uh, on the left, you see a, gyps a stand there of uh, oaks, and uh, not a whole lot of resistance in there. Uh, it was basically all oak, and basically it succumbed to um, pretty much wide-scale mortality. And in terms of resilience, you know, what was done was trying to do some planting. You can see tree shelters in there, trying to bring some oak back into the stand as a practice afterward. You know, it's a little late, but sometimes those are the decisions that choices that we're left with. And uh, thinning, or TSI, timber stand improvement. And it's a big issue on the eastern shore. And I think most people here that may realize that there's a lot of pine on the shore and there's a lot of pine planting. And I think one mistake a lot of landowners make is that once you plant pine trees, then you walk away from it. Unfortunately, those pine trees tend to just kind of stay there. And they get that high stocking. They compete with each other, you get a lot of stress, and that creates the environment for a lot of issues with insects and disease and poor growth and other things. So when you plant pine trees, you really need to look to the future in terms of what are we going to do in terms of making sure those stands of pine are, are thinned out to maintain that vigor and uh, you know, maintain a good, healthy, growing forest. And I'll just mention this briefly, but as a forester, one thing I've always, um, uh, you know, invasive species. Invasive species are bad. Why are they bad? Well, because they take up space of natives. OK. But why are they really bad? And one thing I learned in working with uh, Doug Talame, who's uh, many people here at Master Gardeners know him, is this connection that 
if you walk into the woods and you see a lot of native plants and things like that, they're all full of holes, okay? And that's because caterpillars are eating them and insects. And those caterpillars and insects, they've developed long-term relationships with these trees and shrubs such that they can eat them, but they don't kill them, all right? And if you go into a woods that's packed full of invasives, typically they're not eaten at all. <laughs> and when you think about it, it's all those caterpillars that feed and insects that feed on those leaves that create the food base for a lot of the bird populations and wildlife that's out there. So one of the real downsides of invasive species is that you, you, you lack the capacity to produce that biomass that feeds a lot of your bird populations and small mammals that feed on caterpillars and things like that. And to a forester, frankly, that was kind of a revelation to me. I never really didn't know that. <laughs> I just thought they're bad because they're bad, you know, for some obvious reasons. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. And we have a, a book called The Woods in Your Backyard that uh, is something over here, but uh, that uh, he wrote the foreword in that, kind of made that point. So, Interesting thing. Some other key actions, you know, when you're doing something with your woodland is designing for wind. You know, making sure that's going to be an issue, that you don't have blowdown. Fire control, big issue here on the eastern shore. And if you have storm damage, many times what happens after storm damage is people come by, well, we're just going to we'll help clean up the trees for you. Well, not so fast, you know. When you have storm damage, it's an opportunity to do a number of things in terms of timber stand improvement and thinning to remove some things that also should be removed, not just the trees that are dead. And acting too quickly sometimes and not getting some good advice can be uh, detrimental in facts of forest health. So monitoring for insects and disease, considering flooding and storm surges, and Scott Daniels is going to talk about the susceptibility with regards to that because of sea level rise on the shore. And, um, Asking foresters, there's a, who here has a, a forest stewardship plan for their property at this point, a written forest stewardship plan? Okay, so now you can go as a landowner out in the woods and say, well, I'm going to look for those, those kind of, you know, those obvious things that maybe indicate some type of, you know, forest health issue. And there's everything, peeling broken bark, you know, there's some decay, there's splits in the trees, and you're walking around, well, some of that stuff's okay. So in many cases, it does require a professional to go out there to see really what is the situation. Um, and that's what professional foresters do. Um, so the key to healthy forest is really a planning, uh, a, a, you know, applying sustainable forest management practices based on sound silviculture. In other words, the science and art of silviculture that we know if we do this type of practice, you're going to get this type of result. We can increase the health by doing this. And that requires some professional assistance. And, I, and I, I, make this, I make it very simplistic, okay? You can take all these practices and they're going to be one of three things. You're going to cut something, you're going to plant something, or you're going to do nothing at all. <laughs> now, we call them different things. We call them, you know, thinning and TSI and salvage cutting, but, you know, or tree planting. But basically, these are your options. And I think that the assumption that letting nature take its course is the best venue is really not sound in many cases. So the question is, what do you do this morning here? What's the purpose of this is to kind of listen and learn this morning. You're going to learn about some of the, the nuts and bolts of some of these major uh, pest problems. But for those of you that have some uh, larger parcels, and in Maryland, in most cases, and maybe Scott can correct this, but if you have at least 10 acres of woodland, that you can get a professional plan developed by a professional forester with the DNR Forest Service or even a private consulting forester. And that person, he'll explain to you later about what that encompasses, but basically, that's a professional coming out, making an assessment, doing an inventory, and saying, well, this is what I got. These are some of the issues you're dealing with. These are some of the things you can do. And these are some cost share programs, perhaps, that are out there that can help you actually implement some of these things, you know, if they're cost prohibitive. Uh, we also have a Woods in Your, back woods in your Backyard course. And uh, I had a book up here, but, uh, uh, and basically, that's an online course. We also have... It's kind of a self-assessment. It's for smaller acreage owners that perhaps can't get the services of professional forester. It's kind of a learning process for your own property. And I have some of those books here if you're interested in, in purchasing them. So the whole idea here is implementing good silvicultural practices to make your woods as resilient or resistant and resilient you know, as, as possible. And there's a bunch of different practices we talked about that, that can make that happen. So. Uh, um, and it comes under this whole idea of forest stewardship. So I think everybody here would like to think of themselves as a good steward of the forest. And you know what that means is having a sense of responsibility. Well, 
The fact that many of you are here probably indicates you, you have some sense of responsibility, you want to know more, but also knowing the opportunities. And that's where coming, getting some professional advice, you know, it's kind of like me going to the doctor and saying, well, doc, I think this is what's wrong with me. Well, then why don't you come see me, you know? <laughs> so, um, and being aware of the consequences of actions. And this is where, you know, getting some professional forest resistance or learning more through some other opportunities and venues and being guided by something and having some idea of a plan of what actions I can take over the near and far future to make my woods more uh, resistant and more resilient and, and by, by default healthy. So the so question here is, you know, what history are you writing for the woods that are under your control? And uh, it's great to have everybody here that has an interest in this. So, you know, what we're going to start go over now is that uh, Heather Disk, who is an entomologist, with the Maryland Department of Agriculture, as far as pest programs, she's going to kind of give us a, I think, a roundhouse uh, overview of what are a lot of the major, some of the major issues that are out there that uh, woodland owners would want to uh, consider. So, um, and then we'll move on through the rest of the agenda. We'll take a break at 10 o'clock or 10:30, and um, we'll have a little panel discussion at the end, and have lunch. And the whole idea here is to get everybody out here after lunch so they can spend the rest of their day doing something else. So any, any other questions? Uh